So genes have a major role to play. I have to move a little bit quickly now. There was a very interesting study done by my colleague, George Ebers, who showed that genes of the major histocompatibility complex, MHC, are involved in susceptibility to the disease. And he looked at two populations. He looked at populations that were either severely affected or had what's so-called benign MS. We can argue whether MS is truly ever benign. And he looked at the genes involved with these two particular populations, one in Canada and one in Sardinia in southern Italy. This is George, just to give you a picture of George. He and I were actually residents together at Cornell many, many years ago. What he found was that yes, there were certain genes that indeed were involved in severity. If you had this particular gene, DRB1, 15 slash 15, and if you had two copies of it, one from your dad and one from your mom, you had severe disease. Six-fold higher risk of getting severe MS. But if your other gene from either your mom or your dad was, for example, this 1.09 at the bottom, you had a one-tenth risk of developing severe disease. So it wasn't just enough that you had a severe gene, it was the interaction of two genes, one from your mom, one from your dad, that had a role to play in defining not only whether you got MS, but the severity of the disease that you had. And a similar pattern was really found in people who had benign MS. There were genes that were associated with more benign disease, they reduced the risk very significantly but he only found that in patients from Canada. So the different genetic population of Sardinia had a different set of genes that needed to be interacting. So what does this mean? Well, it means that genes are important, particularly those of the major histocompatibility complex. They play a role not only in susceptibility, but what kind of MS you have. Interactions of two genes, very complex, causing either more severe disease or less Different populations will have different gene interactions, again, increasing the complexity. But if we can figure this out, if we can really understand what these genes are doing, we'll have a major breakthrough in terms of understanding the disease process. So to finish up with very, very quickly, how much time do I have? One minute, 56 seconds and counting down. Infections are known to increase the risk of relapses. We know that, right? No one wants to have infections. Chronic infections cause increasing symptoms. We know that. They cause fatigue. They cause increasing difficulties with walking, with ambulation. Is there such a thing as a good infection? Yes. There was a paper presented, very exciting data, by a friend of mine, Jorge Coriale, who is now in Argentina, Buenos Aires. And it's an example of the prepared mind. You've heard the statement that new discoveries are made only if your brain is willing to receive them. And once you hear that something has been done, you say, you know, why didn't I think of that? Uh, of course, it's, it's obvious in retrospect. But he is a highly intelligent gentleman. This is a picture of him. And what he did was he was taking care of MS patients in Argentina. Argentina has a large population of Northern Europeans. And he found that patients in Argentina were of two populations. One that had a high count of what's called eosinophils, which are certain cells in your blood associated with parasitic infections and those who did not. And those who had high numbers of eosinophils did better. So he studied them and he found that indeed those that had eosinophils had mild parasitic infections. They weren't 95 pounds from tapeworm or anything like that. They just had parasitic infections. Otherwise, they were pretty healthy. And he made the amazing observation that if you look at the clinical course of individuals who have these parasitic infections, he followed them for five years. These are the data that he presented you can see the untreated patients or the uninfected patients are on the top. Those that had parasitic infections are shown underneath. A striking reduction in numbers of attacks and in the extent 
of disability. If you look at the MRI scans, you see a similar picture. New lesions, as expected, occurring up on the top in un uninfected individuals, those who had infections much less in the way of disease activity. Why? So he looked at the immune systems of these individuals, and what he found was that there was a restoration of abnormal immune function in these individuals. They had a reappearance of cells that had the capacity to regulate the immune system, so-called Treg cells, they're called. And not only were they T lymphocytes, he showed the same thing with B cells. And these B cells had the capacity to suppress certain compounds that we know are harmful to people with MS. So the bottom line, what does this mean? What does this all indicate? Well, very exciting, because now you have a so-called natural therapy for MS, but I don't know if anyone wants to be infected with a parasite necessarily. So the key question is, why are parasitic infections beneficial? We have some idea now as to why that's happening. Can one obtain similar effects without actually having an infection? Can you find out what components of the parasites are involved in generating an immune response that seems to be beneficial? And how do you get it into the person? Do you eat it? Do you inject it? We don't know. I can tell you a lot of work is going on in this area. There's even a preliminary clinical trial. Um, there's a physician, John Fleming, in Madison, Wisconsin, was going to be giving whipworm pills to his MS patients. I don't see too many volunteering at the moment. <laughs> but the potential is there. The potential is there. So these are not infected organisms. They have been killed. But very exciting, very exciting observations. And again, more questions are being raised than are really being answered. So what's the bottom line? Research raises more questions than it answers, but that's good. MS is much more complex than we had initially thought 30 years ago, but what it allows us to do, they're being nibbled away. The mysteries are being nibbled away. This is an MS researcher who's nibbling, <laughs> who's nibbling away at the, at the cheese. New concepts of pathogenesis are being developed, new ways of understanding how things are occurring in MS, this inevitably means we're going to have new therapeutic approaches, new ways of intervening, new ways of dealing with and treating MS, and the fight goes on.